One second, it's coming. They've changed everything again. Everything's all new again. No, it's not. <laughs> You're... Well, there you are. There's Nicole. All right. Dr. Gallucci is back into his house. Yay! Dr. Gallucci has office hours. <laughs> Unofficially. Office... Oh, you have office hours. <laughs> Unofficially. They have a test Monday, so I just told them to come by any time today. <laughs> that was my mistake. But... Did you put a sign out or something? I, I just put a sign that says, "Please, I'm, I'm on air. Please give me a minute to pause, and I'll be with you. <laughs> So just stay on mute, and then and then every now and then someone's gonna walk in. Yep. Yeah, that'll be awesome. Yep. Uh, cool. Well, hey everybody, and we've got some some from fresh familiar faces here. This is awesome. Man, yay! We got Sandy. Uh, okay, so let's let's introduce people because I forget what we're gonna be talking about today. But uh, uh, I'm gonna introduce the people. Sandy. Hi. I'm Sandy. I am no longer at Arecibo Observatory. I'm now at the University of Arizona in the Lunar and Planetary Lab Laboratory working on the OSIRIS-REx mission to asteroid Bennu. So OSIRIS-REx, you might know it from its older name. Wasn't it... Uh... The asteroid was 1999 RQ-36. No, but the previous name for OSIRIS-REx. I know this mission's been proposed over the past few decades. Oh, okay. All right. So there probably were name changes at some point in the process. So are you going to become like the Carolyn Porco of Osiris Rex? Is this how this is going to work? <laughs> no pressure, Zondi. <laughs> this, is, this is serious business side-eye I am giving you right now, Fraser. Yeah, let the first-year grad student, you know, get settled <laughs> and do her thing. <laughs> Yeah, all right. Dante is fantastic. I love working for Dante Loretta. I'm convinced he's part of the mob, but he's fantastic, and he really likes that I carry meteorites around with me in my purse. Yeah, I do that too. In your, in your purse? For yeah. I, in this case, my pockets, but yes, anyone who comes near me often ends up with a meteorite. That's just how we roll. Um, so, all right, well, let's move on. So, Dr. Brian Coberline, and you're Hi. looking... Dapper today, I gotta say. Uh, I've been teaching today, so. Yeah, I have not. Hence, t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> this is office hours. This is what they get. I yeah, oh. I dress up on teaching days too. It's oh, you wear the three-piece oh, suit, Nicole. No. Yeah. Oh my god, I should. <laughs> you totally should. Yeah, that would that would say serious, serious professor. Mm -hmm. uh, Morgan Renberg. Hey, Morgan. Hi, suit and meteorite free. <laughs> oh. And we've got this unnamed woman, uh, Nicole Gallucci. My lower third broke again. Yeah. <laughs> it was broken Wednesday. It's broken again today. Yeah. You guys know who I am by now, right? It, it is a it is a fragile technology we are using here. Um, cool. Well, and I'm my name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of the Universe Today, and this is your weekly space hangout for um, I don't know. It's September twelfth. 2014. So today we're going to be talking about uh, we're going to be talking about Rosetta. We're going to be talking about just get my list here. We're going to talk about Rosetta. We're going to talk about Curiosity. We're going to talk about the Chinese space station, the missing lithium in M54. Uh, the universe is going to collapse. Uh, modified dark matter, plate tectonics on Europa. This is awesome. Um, yeah. And, uh, and some Aurora watches. So I'm going to start with the Aurora watch because this is all me and nobody knows what I'm talking about. And this is that the sun released an X-class flare onto the, uh, on its surface uh, two days ago. And X-class flares, these are the most powerful flares that the sun can release. And it takes a day and a half-ish, two days, for the particles to get from the sun to us. And so right now, uh, last night, people in northern Canada, northern Europe, were saying that they were seeing some auroras. And if you go and do a search for... Oh, what is the tool called? Anyway, do do a search for like NOAA Aurora. The you know they've got an amazing map that shows you where the auroras are actually happening right now and what your chances of getting a chance to see one are. And the band that's being visible in the world is actually growing. It's kind of coming down. So, you know, if you're in England, Canada, northern United States, um, Europe. Asia, Northern Asia, then you may have a chance to see some auroras. So I would recommend that you go out and try and watch them tonight. All right, so let's get on with some stories. 
Um, who wants to go first? I want to, you know, Brian, the universe is going to collapse. Tell <laughs> us about this. This is awesome. Uh, okay, this is uh, Stephen Hawking made the declaration, and of course, this makes national press. That's what it comes down to. Nothing Stephen Hawking said was actually new. It has to do with the Higgs boson and quantum mechanics. One of the things about quantum mechanics is a quantum system doesn't have to be in its lowest energy state. If you think about an atom, for example, as a quantum energy state, you can have electrons that are kind of excited. They're in a higher energy state, and then they can drop to a lower energy state and release light. And this is why we see um, line spectra, for example. When, when light, atoms emit light at very specific frequencies, it's because they've dropped from a higher quantum state to a lower quantum state. With the discovery of the Higgs boson, you can ask the question of whether or not the universe is in its kind of lowest energy state. And the answer to that question depends upon what the mass of the top quark is and what the mass of the Higgs boson is. And basically, you could be in the lowest energy state, you could be stable, you could be in kind of an intermediary energy state, in which they call it metastable, uh, and then you could be, you know, off on where it's weird things. <clears throat> Given the mass of the top and the Higgs boson, it looks like the universe is in what we call a metastable state, which means it's not in its lowest energy level. So that means that, theoretically, the universe could drop into a lower energy state. And if that were the case, everything would go poof, apparently. So, you know, you have to take this with a grain of salt. It's, it's one of those things that in quantum mechanics, yes, technically the universe is, does appear to be in a metastable state. But according to quantum mechanics, you could walk through a wall and have a, a very, very tiny chance of actually quantum tunneling through a wall. Uh, it's the same type of thing. The, the chance of the universe doing this is extraordinarily tiny. Um, and that's assuming that the theory is correct. So, so still plan for your retirement. Right. Well, it's one of these situations where you think about how long the universe has been around. And so if there's some kind of cascade reaction that would happen with the number of particles that happen in the entire universe, you would imagine this would have happened already. And, That's and so, one of the arguments, is that if it could have happened, it had happened. In fact, there was an article a while back that showed, when they did the derivation of how strong inflation was based upon the bicep measurements and the mass of the Higgs boson, the universe shouldn't exist. That was the other news thing that went through. Because it should have already completely collapsed on itself because inflation was too strong. Um, these are cutting-edge theoretical ideas, so you know, don't listen to the press. <laughs> Because they're going to have a hard time understanding it. They're going to have a hard time. Well, they're, they're going to say things in which these are just ideas. We're, we're working with ideas and trying to see how they work. Yeah. I mean, this is theoretical astrophysics. Might as well be string theory. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, and, and you're right, this isn't new. I mean, Pamela and I, in Astronomy Cast, Pamela's been bringing this up for years and years and years. I mean, probably, you know, because I'm always interested in the way everything's going to end. And I know that Pamela has brought this this topic up many times before, saying that that there's this concept of quantum quantum theory that you know she always described it as it's like a it's like a mountain you know with a hill on the top with a flat top mm -hmm. and you take a ball and you put it on the top of the hill and then there's a chance that this thing's going to roll downhill and and reach a lower state and that's sort of the right. the situation that we're looking at with the whole universe and right. and you know the fact that it hasn't happened I think is you know means it, it it'll never happen don't you worry about it. Um, all right, so Sonny, can you give us an update on Rosetta? Yes, I can give you an update on Rosetta. So some of you might have seen that uh, Rosetta has land uh, has arrived at Comet Trivmov Gershmenko. Did I got that right? Sixty seven P. At least so, I'm gonna pretend so, I got that right. Well, yeah. So just to just to bring you up to speed here, it's you know we're calling it Churi Guri, and the reason we're doing that is because Emily Lockdewalla said that was okay. Okay, well, if Emily Lakdawalla says it's okay to call it Comet Shuri Guri, then I will call it Comet yeah. Shuri Guri. We've also 67, been calling it... Or 67P, but, you know, save yourself the pain. NPR, a couple weeks ago, didn't even try pronouncing the name. But it looks like a rubber duck comet, and some people say that's a little wild, but a lot of comets do look like these two-lobed structures with sort of this, this neck connecting them. It's sort of this 
more looks like dirt rather than solid rocks, like the two lobes of a comet. But the exciting thing recently with the spacecraft is it took a selfie. Let me take a selfie. Um, and it wasn't truly a selfie. It wasn't the spacecraft photographing itself, but its little uh, fillet lander that still attached the spacecraft actually turned around and took a photo of the spacecraft solar panels as well as the comet in the background. And so it's, that uh, happened on the 7th. So it's a really beautiful photo. It's very cool to see that taken. So that was not necessarily a, oh, hey, let's go win at social media this week. It was more of a, let's make sure all the instruments on the fillet lander are working as we expect. So that's kind of cool. So that's what's up with that. And um, ESA is in the process of selecting a landing site on the comet. And the other interesting right. thing is a paper actually just came out on the, uh, on the on comet science recently. So that's pretty cool that it got through peer review that quickly. So there's a lot happening with Rosetta right now. And the landing... I mean, we've been talking about this, that the landing is a little complicated because there aren't a lot of really nice landing spots on the on the comet. It's actually quite mountainous and rocky and, and you know, there's not a lot of big, flat places. And so they've had a really hard time choosing a landing spot. Right, and it's, um, it's a pretty rough surface. If you've looked at uh, images of this comet that have been returned from the spacecraft, it doesn't look particularly nice. It's got all these ridges, it's got these boulders, it's got these sharp edges, and if you want to send a little lander down, well, that's, that's probably, uh, you don't want to land where there are jagged cliffs and prominent boulders. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's pretty important to uh, select a landing site that's pretty flat and smooth. So. so then, like, how is this going to play out then in the next little while? When when are they going to try and make their attempt to land on the on the comet? So I think they're going to choose um, the least worst landing site this weekend, and I think it's another couple weeks before they find the most lander friendly place to quote the BBC. So it's and, uh, it's still a little bit out. And then they're going to make their landing attempt, and and of course, uh, philae has got this harpoon on board, and it's going to fire it at the comet. And then reel itself in, and 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 then is it done? Is it stuck to the comet forever? Then I, think, I don't think it, I don't think it's coming home. It doesn't look like it can come back. Yeah, this is not a sample return mission, so it should land around November 11th, which will coincide with this big meeting we're having here in Tucson for planetary scientists that week. So that will be lots of fun to watch. And there's 10 science instruments on board. It's a 100 kilogram lander, so that's actually pretty heavy. And I know that there's ground penetrating radar on the spacecraft or on the lander, so they'll be able actually to get an idea of um, what this comet looks like on the inside. Is it uniform? Does it have big cracks? Is it made out of chunks of other things? So that will be pretty exciting. Oh, that's great. All right, let's move on. Morgan, you want to talk about a Chinese uh, space station, right? Yes, indeed. So China, are, in fact, already has uh, a space station in a sense. They have uh, an orbiting lab uh, called Tiangong-1. Uh, and it's very similar to uh, sort of the U.S. Skylab from the 1970s. Uh, but this week they sort of reiterated, I'm not sure if there was a lot of new information here, but they came out and sort of firmed up uh, their plans moving forward uh, when it comes to um, how they want to develop their, their space program. And they're one of a few countries that isn't basically allowed or hasn't been asked to join the International Space Station program. So we have space countries like China and North Korea and Iran that are active in space development but haven't been uh, permitted to participate on the ISS. And China still wants to maintain a presence in space, so they're planning to build their own competitor to the ISS, essentially. But Building space stations is really tricky, so it's going to take a while to do it. Uh, and the next step is to launch basically an upgraded version of the current module uh, in two years' time. And so this, the one they have now is going to be what's called deorbited, which basically means they're going to crash it into the atmosphere and let it burn up like a meteor. And they're going to send up a new one instead. It's going to be just more advanced than the one that's already been there for a few years. And they're going to use that to send another crew out there to learn how crews can live in space. And they're also going to practice unmanned supply delivery. And this is a key element to maintaining a space station because uh, we don't want to send people up as frequently as we need to send up food and water and air and things like that. Uh, and so 
with the ISS, we used the Russian Progress spacecraft as well as various private companies uh, from the United States to deliver these, these payloads. Uh, China's developed a whole system from scratch, and they need to test that. Uh, then two years later, in 2018, they'll launch the first component, basically, of uh, the future uh, space station, and this will be a, an orbiting laboratory. And then by 2022, they, have to ha they hope to have the whole thing sort of up and operational. And it won't be as big as the ISS, uh, but it will offer the ability then for Chinese astronauts to spend months in space as opposed to the weeks that they're basically capable of spending in space up to this point. Yeah, I mean, we've talked about how the, I mean, the Chinese are going on a completely separate track for space exploration. Do you think that that the path that they're going is more oriented towards like long term? like just extending their reach further and further and further because like with the ISS it feels like a like a destination a final destination like the ISS is built we've we're done let's you know let's move on to something else like yeah you know, like i mean in a way they're basically replicating what the soviet union and the united states did in the 60s and 70s and they're just now having the experience of seeing us do it they can tweak the order a little bit to make it most efficient. So this would be sort of like if the US had sent up Skylab before going to the moon. Uh, China is very much still playing catch up uh, to Russia and the United States here, but they have the benefit of having seen it done before. And so at this point I'd say they are looking to the future and they are pushing forward, but that's only because they haven't gotten to the point that we are now. And until they get there, we won't really know whether they have the capability or the interest of pushing beyond and going uh, elsewhere, like the Mar like Mars or an asteroid or something, uh, because at this point they're still trying to develop a lot of the basic technologies that have become more or less routine for uh, countries like the U.S. and Russia. Yeah, it's a it's a tough thing to sort of imagine how this is going to play out in the next little while. Are they going to? Man, I don't want to say get bogged down, but but continue extending and building this really elaborate space station structure, the way the the international coalition has, or are they going to build like just enough space station to learn all the valuable lessons of long duration space flight and then keep pushing out? Maybe have a, a high altitude space station or a or go straight to a you know a lunar landing. So I'd be interested right. to see yeah, how that's all going to play out. It's too early to know, but uh, they're certainly catching up. And as long as they, like the U.S. and Russia, continue to explore space peacefully, then the more countries we have up there, the better, because there's enough space for all of us. I wonder if it's going to look anything like the gravity Chinese space station. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not sure exactly uh, how close to that it'll look, but of course that's what the Chinese space station is most famous for now, is not for any of the space missions that have been to the Chinese space station. Um, I, will, I will make one little aside here, uh, which is that nobody in space has matched the U.S. in figuring out how to promote themselves. When I was writing a story about uh, Tiangong space station, I was Googling wildly for a picture of it. There is not a single picture of their space station in orbit on the internet. Not one. There's not a picture of their crew working outside of it. There's not a picture of their uh, ship docked to it. Not a single picture. Uh, and as we've seen from things like Sandy's space selfie, these things grab headlines and they get people interested. And other countries really need to uh, figure that out and step up in that regard because that builds awareness of space all over uh, the world and that is only going to encourage people to, to get more active in space and, and science in general. Yeah, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. It is, I mean, the best organization for doing social media across all industries, in my opinion, is NASA. They are so good at this. It's humbling. It's amazing to be sort of receiving the fire hose of NASA content and photographs and videos and stories and tweets, and then they they engage with you in conversation. And it's it's the, whoever is the architect of this machine is the best. I bow down to you. Um, and yeah, you're exactly right. Although the the rover, the Chinese rover was was pretty good. There was pretty good photos and information coming out of various Chinese state agencies. We got pretty great pictures and, and live feeds and stuff, so that was better. But yes, I, it, it sounds like they're trying to be a little more secretive about 
this than they were with some of their other stuff. Like I think this is on purpose. Um, all right, Nicole, your turn. Okay. Tell us about Europa. Yeah, this is a story that would have passed um, my notice, but it was brought to my attention actually um, through the Skeptic contact form by Critical Dragon. Uh, it's about plate tectonics on Europa. Um, so up until now, Earth is the only body in the solar system that has uh, a particular system of plate tectonics where you have new material being created at some fault zones and other material going, you know, the plates going underneath each other and going back into the system, into the mantle. Um, there's a really great demonstration of this using Oreos, which we came uh, at conferences and stuff. So um, this is a study. People have been looking at the surface of Europa and in particularly trying to... So they, they see areas where new material is forming, and this is tied in pretty intimately into the ocean that we are pretty sure is underneath that, that icy crust. So they've seen places where new crust is forming, and you've got really young material, um, but they hadn't seen... Play I mean, there's no, like, you know, mountain ridges the way sometimes the fault, you know, the, the, the plates come together on Earth and they create mountain ridges. Um, you don't necessarily see that in Europa, uh, but they were able to put it together like a jigsaw puzzle and actually find... Um, places where there are plates with, with uh, some of the material going underneath another, not creating mountains the way it would on Earth, um, but there is a global tectonic system, a recycling of the crust. Uh, and they're showing that um, what's happening is it's probably uh, the old crust is, is melting and becoming, kind of not necessarily diving completely below the surface, but becoming part of the underneath the, the plate that it's going under and creating ice volcanoes and cryovolcanism, all kinds of cool things like that. Have you so, ever been on a boat that's moving through water with a thin layer of ice on top of it? I have not. No. So what? So I, you know, if you've ever been, done this and seen this, that what you see is the, the ice breaks in front of you and then it um, sort of just goes underneath and then just gets pushed underneath, but but it doesn't because it's ice and it will it would right. rather crack than than try to form that mountain. You you get it just either breaking or going underneath. Right. I mean the the amazing part about this this conversation is that you know trying to explore Europa and I'm sure Morgan will jump in at any point here. Um, you know, if you want to find life on Europa, the thought was you got to drill. You got to take some kind of nuclear-powered super drill, and you've got to have it melt its way down ten kilometers of ice until it can get through and and start to explore the the ocean below, which you still will want to do. Right. But you may up and end up with thinner points where these cracks are happening, and that's easy access. Right. But even better, you're going to get this material that's that was below the water is now being deposited maybe on the surface, and so maybe some of the interesting secrets that would be below the ocean that you can't normally get is making its way to the surface through some of these cracks. So it's a, yeah. it, suddenly nature has demonstrated, it's, you know, Europe is trying to make our job a little easier. It really is saying, please, come on, come on, consider Europa. <laughs> Look at me! Yeah. yeah, it's not clear to me how... So plate tectonics is unique to Earth, but it's not clear to me whether that has any effect on the habitability of Europa um, just having plate tectonics, but you're right, it does mean there's a communication happening now between what's underneath and what's on the surface, which makes our search for life on Europa a little bit easier. Well, and you know can if... imagine this idea of panspermia, right? Uh, where materials being exchanged between the planets mm -hmm. all the time, has been done through history, and so you're going to have meteorites with life on them landing on the surface of Europa, just the way they, you know, we can find meteorites out on Antarctica, and then these plate tectonics taking these meteorites and, and smooshing them down below into this nice warm ocean beneath, where there's like a potentially habitable environment down there. So yeah, Plate tectonics are usually considered a very big boon for life, uh, not only because they can bring material down, subduct it, like Frazier was describing, <laughs> but also because as these plates slide, they create friction, and friction creates heat, and especially in a place like Europa that's very cold, that heat is, would be a valuable energy source for microbes, and it also, as material, excuse me, as material, <laughs> as material uh, comes up from below, it brings uh, 
chemicals and nutrients that bacteria that can then eat that might be floating in that water. So areas where you have a lot of plate activity are uh, good places to look for life. Unfortunately, those are usually at the bottom of the ocean. Okay. Um, so we can look uh, at the top, at these cracks or these geysers, uh, for evidence that those conditions might exist below particular chemicals, salts, organic compounds, that would be great. Uh, but to actually see the evidence of that life is probably, if it exists, all the way down at the bottom where this heating is happening. So there's no getting around us making the nuclear-powered super drill? Well, not if we want to, like, see uh, little Europa microbes uh, swimming around in our sample. Uh, but, you know, we can find compelling evidence uh, for that sort of thing from the surface, but we're not going to see a smoking gun. Uh, and drilling to the bottom and getting through the ocean and finding this stuff, we're a long, long, long way from doing this. I mean, many decades away from, from anything like that. So let's not, let's not get too focused on actually seeing the life when first we want to establish whether or not it's even habitable. But, you, but I want microbes. I don't yeah. want to... <laughs> Yeah. We I come want in my, peace, a Europa microbes. I want my Europa shark. <laughs> yeah. Don't, don't, don't you worry, it. Morgan. I I can speculate all day. Yeah, oh. that we know. <laughs> don't you worry about me. Um, all right, well, let's move on. Um, I, now I want to know about, um, let's see. All right, Brian, you put this into the docket. Uh, modified dark matter may solve the dwarf galaxy problem. I didn't know that we had a dwarf galaxy problem. Yes. <laughs> it's because we don't normally talk much about it. We don't like to talk about our failures. I, we I like do, to talk about our successes. I think it's fascinating, but whatever. <laughs> What's that, Nicole? I, did, you, I do. I think it's fascinating, the missing you, galaxy you have problem. A dark, you have a dwarf galaxy problem? I have a missing, yeah, we have a missing matter problem. Okay, Brian, what is, what's, where'd our missing mass go? What's going on? Okay, so the, we all know the basic idea of dark matter is uh, the majority of matter in the universe, it doesn't interact with light, or at least doesn't interact with light strongly, and that's the key. We have some observational limits on how little dark matter would interact with light. One of the big ones is from the cosmic microwave background, since it's so distant if, if dark matter interacted with light and at a certain level, we would see the effects. We would see the dampening effects from it. We don't see it, so we know that dark matter can't interact with, with light very strongly at all. Usually, most of the models will take that dark matter doesn't interact with, directly with light, so that it doesn't interact on electromagnetic. It'll interact with the weak. But the problem is that when you run computer simulations with dark matter, it works really well for things like the bullet cluster. It works really well for large-scale structures of galaxies and how they clump. But it, the computer simulations predict that a, a spiral galaxy like the Milky Way should have something on the order of 500 to 1,000 dwarf galaxies around it. And it doesn't. And galaxies, as a rule, don't have that many dwarf galaxies around them. So it's been one of these big problems. Why do we keep predict? Why does dark matter predict all these dwarf galaxies that would orbit, you know, the Milky Way when we don't see that type of thing? So this new work um, proposed that you have dark matter that interacts very, very, very slightly with light, and you run the computer simulations, and what you find is you get the right number of dwarf galaxies that we actually see that you can actually tweak the amount of light interaction. And most of the interaction with light would be in the earliest period of the universe. And so basically that small effect builds up to have dramatic effects in the present universe. And so by tweaking the parameters, they can actually make their simulations get in the range of what we actually see around galaxies. What's interesting about that is that if you assume that the model works, and then look at the number of galaxies, you can put a, an upper limit on what the dark matter interaction would be. And it's actually much lower than the cosmic microwave background limit. So, so basically what they've said is they've been able to use this model to kind of even further drop down how much light could work, uh, could interact with uh, dark matter. So I just want to unpack that a second here. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, if dark matter interacts with light, then 
slightly, then that helps explain where the dwarf galaxies are. But right. the thing that we can see, and this is what you just mentioned, is that we see the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is the which is the end of the universe in all directions, of the visible universe in all directions. And so right. you would think that any influence of light that's going to happen to those those dwarf galaxies is going to happen significantly to the cosmic microwave background radiation. So what implication would it have on our understanding of the cosmic microwave background radiation? Um, if this is true, if it if it is interacting with light, does it push? Does it make the universe, um, you know, do, it, it would it would make the CMBR dimmer, so it was no, less actually, energetic. It was it was more energetic than we thought. No, actually, if you look at if you look at the cosmic like the, the CMB, the cosmic microwave background, um, based upon the fact that we don't see an effect of dark matter through light from from the cosmic background, that puts a certain level of how strongly light could interact. Light could interact no more strongly than this. Uh, otherwise, we'd see the effect. And so that's kind of the limit of our detection of, of the microwave background. The models here predict the light interaction that's actually much, much lower. So they actually, in, they actually predict from these models that we would not see it. Based upon our current devices, we would not see an effect in the cosmic microwave background. At, at all? Because, I mean, if it's, if it's like a slight fog, you know, if, you, if you've got a light and it's behind a slight fog, right. then does that mean that the light is brighter than you thought it was? Meaning that the universe was hotter than we thought it was. Right. It wouldn't, it wouldn't change the results in a measurable way based okay. upon the limits of what we have. So, yes, it would make it look dimmer, but the amount that it would dim is too small for us to detect. Mm. So, so we don't why? have devices sensitive enough to actually detect this effect from the CMB. Yeah, so we already know that dark matter interacts with light gravitationally. So right. what, kind of, what kind of interaction are we talking about here? Is this an electromagnetic interaction? Like they are talking the about an electromagnetic interaction. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I mean, they just what they do in their simulations is they propose some initially diffuse dark matter that has some slight cross-section with light. Okay. So do you think that it's more likely that the simulations for the number of dwarf galaxies is, is wrong or the, the possibility that dark matter is, is getting in the way is right? I think we've, we've got a lot of good evidence for dark matter. I mean, dark matter works extraordinarily well for things like large-scale structure specifically cold dark matter. So other people have tried other things like warm dark matter or hot dark matter. But cold dark matter seems to be the one that really, really works. It's just these things on the edge, like dwarf galaxies, that it doesn't work very well. What's interesting about this is that it shows how you can actually kind of tweak the theory to address some of the problems. doesn't mean it's true. Weak theories are weak theories. But... Um, but it shows that it's possible. The big thing is, can we detect dark matter directly? If we, can, if we can have some type of direct observation of it, then we can pin down what it is. Cool. All right, so Sandy, um, I don't know if you've had, had a chance to bring yourself up to speed, but, but I'd like to talk a bit about where Curiosity's at. So Curiosity, after 25 Earth months in the Martian desert, it's at the uh, base of Mount Sharp. So that's uh, this, this mountain in the middle of Gale Crater. So this was chosen as a landing site a bajillion years ago for the Mars Science Laboratory, or Curiosity. And uh, what's cool about this mountain is it has um, lots of layers of clay, the base of the mountain. So if you can look at these layers, you can start sort of learning the history of Mars. Because we have lots of clay here on Earth, and you can get an idea of when these layers were put down. Um, so this is very exciting uh, for that so it's been almost so it's been over two years to get here, and uh, so that's pretty cool. And they're taking little samples here and there, but if you, I know last week you talked about the senior review of Curiosity and sort of the take home was that MSL Curiosity needs to drive more slowly and do more science along the way and really figure out if these rocks here would have been conducive for microbial life. Whether or not microbial life ever lived there, well, we don't know, but we can at least get an idea about whether or not it would have been conducive, these environments would have been conducive to having microbial life. 
And so do you think that's what's going to happen based on the chastisement that they received and the, uh, and the sort of nice position of the rover now? I think, um, I think you sort of have to do what the funding body tells you to. <laughs> some, some missions are very good at um, sort of telling folks at NASA that they're going to do what they please, but sometimes you have to be slapped on the wrist and reminded that no, like these, this is, taxpayers do need to get the maximum science for their dollar. So it's, uh, I think, you know, part of Curiosity's mission is to look uh, for where there could be organic molecules preserved, what environments might have had life, and uh, also avoiding some sharp rocks along the way, because we've all seen the images of Curiosity's wheels, and we've seen how damaged they look. They've really been eaten up by the rocks. Right. And so by just drive, by just sitting there, scooping and shooting things with a laser, it, uh, it, should, it should be able to decrease the wear and tear on those wheels. Yeah. So it um, should, uh, should be exciting that we're finally here at Mount Sharp, because it's sort of been this goal for the last two years to get there. And... Uh, and there's gonna, they're gonna, um, uh, curiosity by looking at these layered formations, these sedimentary deposits, you're gonna see millions, up to tens of millions of years of Martian history, which is kind of cool. I wonder if the if the terrain is gonna be difficult to go up I at mean, this point, if if they are gonna go up. I think, I mean, I think, yeah, there is, uh, is some concern about the terrain. There have been uh, changes made to the driving plan to at least avoid some of the sharp rocks, and I think this is a challenge, but I think um, I think this rover is up for it, and I think it's going to do a lot of, uh, it's going to uh, drive less and drill more, said Grotzinger. Right. This is not a, um, uh, yeah. <laughs> this will be a drill baby drill mission. <laughs> Right. I cannot be the first person to make that joke. <laughs> I refrained from saying that about Europa like 10 minutes ago. Yeah. Oh, actually, I really want to get excited about Europa for a minute because I'm taking a planetary global tectonics course. And so Adam Showman is teaching the class, and he hadn't read that paper on Tuesday. So a couple of us were like, yeah, Europa supposedly has plate tectonics. And Showman's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Who, who's the author on that paper? Let him know. He's like, oh, okay, well, that person does good science. Maybe it's valid. But Europa is right. very cool because uh, on the, the micro scale, the, the Maxwell time for soft ice is very within an order of magnitude for the orbital period. So that's why you have so much heat dissipation on Europa. It's not just because of the orbital properties. It's also because of the ice properties. So Europa is pretty sweet. We should totally send that Europa clipper there. Y'all should write your congressional representatives and tell them that the Europa clipper would be a cool mission with lots yeah. of science return. Would you be willing to be the primary investigator? Um, I, mm, I would rather be PI on uh, Time, which is the tit Titan Mare Explorer, which is the boat that would go sail the methane yes, seas of, of Titan. Yeah. I have uh, my Kraken Mare expedition stickers and mugs somewhere. Release the Kraken. All right. Um, Morgan, Lithium. Yeah, so this is another uh, problem that we're trying to solve. Uh, but it turns out instead we just made the problem more widespread, so that's unfortunate. Uh, if we step back, uh, all the way back to the Big Bang, in just the first few minutes, five, ten minutes after the Big Bang, uh, the universe created virtually all the matter that will ever exist, uh, and it's almost entirely hydrogen and helium. It's about three-quarters hydrogen, one-quarter helium. And this was predicted by uh, the Big Bang Theory, and when we look out in nature, we see the ratio almost exactly as predicted. And this is one of the strongest pieces of evidence for uh, the existence of the Big Bang. But the theory also predicts that a tiny amount of lithium should also be produced. About one lithium atom for every billion or ten billion hydrogen and helium atoms out there. And when we look out in the universe for lithium, we don't see that same agreement that we do for hydrogen and helium we see a lot less lithium. And this has been called the lithium problem or the lithium discrepancy uh, for several decades now. But because of how we have to look for lithium, which is by observing stars and the atmospheres of stars and seeing the spectral lines, the signature basically of lithium in the atmosphere of these stars, we were restricted to looking at pretty nearby stars. And so all we could say for sure was that lithium was unusually depleted within our own galaxy. So somehow the Milky Way had too little lithium. 
And you could kind of make an argument. Well, maybe somehow the Milky Way formed out of a region of the universe that lithium just happened to be a little bit lower in. But that's not really a convincing argument. Uh, and so we were looking, well, can we, can we nail this down a little bit better? And so what this group of researchers did is they observed uh, a globular cluster, which is a compact cluster of stars. Uh, and in this case, M54, a globular cluster not located within our own Milky Way, but within one of these dwarf satellite galaxies that Brian was alluding to. In this case, sat, uh, the Sagittarius uh, dwarf galaxy. And when they did these same observations of the surfaces and atmospheres of stars in M54, they found very similar uh, discrepancy of the lithium amount. It was about the same amount of lithium in the stars in M54 as there are in the stars in the Milky Way. And both of those numbers are less than we would predict based on the otherwise extremely successful uh, Big Bang model. And so there's a couple of possible solutions or answers to this problem. One is that we're wrong with the Big Bang model and somehow our computations for lithium are just a little bit off and that's leading to discrepancies with what are otherwise very accurate observations. But some recent evidence uh, suggests that that's probably not the case. So that leaves another possibility, which is somehow that lithium is getting used up or hidden away from sight. Uh, and it's not unusual or surprising to think that lithium could be used up because compared to a lot of other elements, you don't need a really hot star to break it up. And some of the chemical reactions that go into making the heavier elements, things like carbon and nitrogen, uh, use lithium as one of their components. Also, even though it's only the third lightest element, compared to hydrogen and helium, lithium is heavy. And so you can imagine that if you make a star, which is basically a ball of hydrogen and helium and a little bit of lithium, it's possible that lithium has uh, sunk down preferentially towards the center of the star. And since all we can do from really far away is look at the surface of the star, we see less lithium per volume than there actually is because it's all hiding down there in the core. Uh, we don't know the answer to that question yet, but we do now, we can cross off the notion that it's, this is special for the Milky Way. Uh, and that really kind of confines the answers that now we can look towards. Brian, do you have an opinion? We don't have a solution to this. We're basically, all the types of solutions that we thought would be reasonable, um, one of them was miscalculating and the other one was, was some type of local region. We've eliminated the two biggest solutions. So, so now we're down to um, harder problems. Like, was the Big Bang wrong? <laughs> yeah, I don't think this throws out the Big Bang as a model because it works so well on many other levels. But um, I think there's likely some mechanism that's hiding the lithium from us for whether it's being consumed in early stars in a way that we don't understand or whether it's, um, you know, just not showing up in the spectral lines in the way that we expect. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> I think, Nicole, you have one last thing you wanted to tell us. Yeah, <clears throat> this is kind of a quick announcement, especially for those of you who are in or near Virginia, West Virginia, or New Mexico in the U.S. Uh, Jill Tarter has been awarded the Jansky Lectureship for 2014. This means that she will be giving a talk at all of the major national radio astronomy observatory sites in the U.S. Uh, Jill Tarter is, uh, Dr. Jill Tarter, of course, is, is with the SETI Institute. Um, and uh, the character of Ellie Arroway in Contact was at least partly based on, on her career as well as that of many others within SETI that Carl Sagan knew. Uh, she's a really great speaker. It's going to be a really great topic, I'm sure. Um, so these are coming up um, in October and November. Again, Charlottesville, Virginia, Green Bank, West Virginia, or Socorro, New Mexico. If you're near those places, they are free and open to the public. Uh, do check it out because when they have a good speaker, it's, a good, it's usually a good time. So I'm sad I, I don't live in Charlottesville anymore for that one. Is she, so is she going to come close if she's going to be speaking at all the radio observatories? What's the closest one to you? None. None. <laughs> I don't in know. Edwardsville. Not Thousand close to Edwardsville. Yeah, yeah. Like I say, if you're if you're if you're you know, Virginia or New Mexico, pretty much. But um, yeah, hopefully. I mean, sometimes they they make they do a video of it. Uh, not too often, but. Um, 
anyway, if you're there, check it out. Uh, it's a pretty cool. Uh, it's a pretty cool honor for her and uh, a good, good opportunity for outreach in those areas. So we've got time for a couple of questions, and then we will uh, move on. So uh, this comes from Tom Nafee. Uh, how are Curiosity's wheels holding up? Last I saw, they were getting pretty beat up. I know if Sonny wants to grab that one, or Morgan. Oh, here we go. He's got some buttons. He's got a big mute button on her computer or something. Sorry, I, I, I didn't bring my uh, webcam in, and I didn't realize that my office computer doesn't have a webcam. So we're on my phone today. We're in really? Oh. Yeah. I had no idea this was your phone. Oh, that works pretty well. Actually. I know, right? Like, I'm, and these new iPhones that are coming out, it's like, this won't even fit in my pocket. I'm pretty happy with my 5S. It, it, it does great things. It's also good for taking cat photos. Um, so I think, you know, there's damage happening to these wheels, and I don't think it necessarily prevents the wheels from working. At least that's what Emily was saying a while ago. Um, but, yeah, it just looks bad, and I think future rovers are hopefully going to address that. I think they're working on that for Mars 2020. Anyone else want to comment? Yeah, it's important to stress that all the time that we talk about wheel damage, this isn't catastrophic wheel damage. Uh, if I remember right, the wheels were designed to function missing something like 40% of their surface. Uh, and what we're seeing are lots of little holes and peels in the wheel. Uh, and, of course, Curiosity has six wheels, but doesn't actually need six wheels to drive. Uh, and so the rover isn't in damage uh, or in danger of you know, having to stop because of this damage. Uh, it's concerning from the perspective of we always want to maintain the highest health level we can for our spacecraft, but all spacecraft pick up wear and tear. Uh, this one just happens to be doing it a bit faster than maybe we expected. Well, let's uh, go down to the store and buy another set of wheels, and we'll just get that installed. Yeah, but Sandy's right. You can bet that they're busy redesigning the wheels for Mars 2020 right now. Yeah, carbon fiber maybe. Yeah, it's a really challenging problem because you have to have wheels that can support the uh, many, many, many uh, hundreds of kilograms of weight of Curiosity, but are also extremely lightweight themselves because you have to minimize overall weight, uh, mm -hmm. and yet can travel on rock and sand and clay and all of these different types of uh, material, uh, and you want them to be distinctive so that you don't confuse them with anything else you're seeing. It's, it's a very challenging problem to divine, design the rover wheels. Uh, and so far, you know, whether you look at uh, Sojourner or Spirit or Opportunity or Curiosity, we've done a pretty good job in getting functional wheels out there that have lasted as long as uh, they needed to. Mm -hmm. uh, that's sort of all. That was the main question that we got. A couple of them we actually had answered in the uh, in the broadcast. I think we'll we'll move forward. So um, let's uh, let's wrap things up. So Sandy, now that you are in your new office, where where do we find out more about you? I'm I'm on Twitter. I'm at Sandy. Um, there's some talk of maybe trying to get me to help out with Osiris Rex social media, since since apparently Dante Loretta doesn't understand Twitter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, you'll be very good at it. Academics don't understand Twitter? What? <laughs> they, they do have a social media person, and he does reply to my tweets about um, finding black cats in coal bins is going to be like imaging this asteroid we're sending the spacecraft to. <laughs> well, like, I, think we'll you, I think you definitely should. I, I, I nominate you. Because <laughs> uh, you're very good Maybe they'll pay me more since, oh my god, grad student salaries. Ha! Um, <laughs> you had to go back. Oh, oh no. <laughs> Brian Coverline, uh, where do we find out more? You can find me on Twitter at Brian Coverline and on my website, which is BrianCoverline.com. Morgan? Yep, I'll be taking uh, any other questions you have after this over on the Google Plus Space community. Uh, you can find me at Morgan Renberg on Twitter. Uh, you can read my ramblings at cosmicchatter.org. And if you're in the Denver area, you can come see the premiere of my new show, Above and Beyond, uh, at Fisk Planetarium on Monday night. Wait, what? Cool! What's yeah, this about? Yeah, I'm excited. Uh, it's a brand new uh, planetarium show series that I've been putting together uh, that brings together uh, conversations about science and society uh, and how the, these two populations can, uh, can interact. Um, and so on Monday night, we'll be talking about uh, space flight and whether or not it makes sense to be spending money on human space flight versus robotic space flight, uh, where we should be going and what we should be doing with it. And so if you live in the 
you live in the Denver, Boulder uh, metropolitan yeah. area, come on down and uh, check it out. That's cool. So where can people find out more information about this? Uh, you can find it on my website, cosmicchatter.org, or at fisk.colorado.edu. That's fantastic. That's, that's going to be really great. Uh, okay, Nicole. So as uh, will eyed one mentions in the comments, I am the Noisy Astronomer, so you can find me at noisyastronomer.com. <laughs> Uh, and Twitter and all the things. Um, currently working for part time for CosmoQuest and also for the Southern Illinois University Edwardsville STEM Center doing Teen Science Cafe and I'm teaching a class and yeah, all the fun things. Uh, so let's do a little bit of uh, shameless self promotion. Uh, one being go to Cosmo Academy and take a look at all the yes. cool classes that we've got going on at Cosmo Academy. Uh, I think the one that's currently open is Messages from the stars. It's a class being co-taught by two astrophysicists and a poet uh, talking about uh, astronomy through literature throughout the ages. So that uh, looks really awesome. Uh, that does sound out on Cosmo Academy. Yeah. Yeah, cosmoacademy.org, reasonable price, learn directly from astrophysicists, astronomers, and now poets. I've taught classes from it. It's so much fun. Even yeah. my yeah. mom took one of my classes. So y'all oh. see this cool <laughs> as my Thanks, mom. mom. She really wanted to learn about asteroids and meteorites. I want to know what you do, honey. Yeah. Actually, <laughs> She, she learned a lot, and so when I uh, she, we drove down here to Tucson and she dropped me off at grad school, uh, she dropped, well, she flew back, and uh, she actually wound up talking with Dante Loretta about meteorites, and she, you know, she's an artist, right, and she had a coherent conversation with Dante about meteorites, so that was pretty cool. Good job, Mom. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, and then the other thing that, as Morgan said, uh, he's going to be answering questions in the Google Plus space community, which you can find on the Google Plus. And I also want to give a shout out to all the folks of the Weekly Space Hangout, the, the WSH crew. Yeah. So find a whole separate community just on Google Plus for the WSH crew. We um, all the all the regulars are there talking to each other and sharing their space news. And I think how awesome is that that this organically appeared and uh, and I think it's fantastic and I get all your notifications and I do not have time to to participate and I apologize in advance so um, anyway I, so we I occasionally am, give them little hints of when the uh, new hangouts are coming well it's a great way for them to yeah it's a great yeah, way for them Gito to keeps come the together and, and organize the themselves and man it's it's so great so so fantastic um, uh, so you can reach me on Twitter at fkane. You can find me on Google Plus, Fraser Kane. Um, and uh, yeah, I will. We will see you all next week.